Hello and welcome to season two of Not a Buffalo, the show where we discuss the science and technology that will save the world. My name's Jack and I have forgotten what a podcast is. And this is Ben and he's forgotten how to talk. So this next part will be interesting. Ben, how are you? No, I'm actually okay. I just watched a YouTube video there and uh, I've, I've relearned the English language in its entirety and it took about six minutes. It's amazing what they can do on YouTube nowadays. Uh, but no, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm very well, thanks. How are you? <laughs> I'm impressed. I, I always thought English was like tough-ish, like not super tough, but like relatively tough. And I'm really, I'm genuinely impressed. Well, I was relearning. I wasn't learning it from scratch. So that, that gave me a little bit of an advantage. Yeah. It's like that time that you, you retaught yourself how to play bongos, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just it's... like, it, it comes back to you. Sometimes you just need a little nudge to get you going in the in the right direction. Nice. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm good. It, it's been it's been a while. It's been a whole summer, a weird summer. How, how's your summer been? It's It's been glorious. It's like genuinely glorious. Like the weather's just broken really here. And it's been 30 degrees continuously for about a month and on the balcony regularly. It's just, it, it's fabulous. Like nothing. Nothing compares with a beautiful, warm summer. Well, we're kicking off season two with a lot of clues as to where Jack lives. <laughs> <laughs> the saga continues. That's, that's, and I'm sure. I'm sure there's thousands of listeners out there now, you know, marking up <laughs> all the weather records and temperature records around the world, trying to find the places that have been around about thirty degrees. I mean, Jack could be lying or exaggerating. Uh, just, just to throw that out there. But <laughs> he probably is. He's that kind of guy. <laughs> Yeah, he has been known to have a flair for the dramatic, let's be honest. <laughs> I don't know what you mean. Also, are you excited for our exciting new end of program segment, Ben? I am. I think that'll uh, I'll add a, a definitely a new twist to the show and uh, give the listeners uh, something new to sink their teeth into. Obviously, we're not going to give any more hints about it just now. You'll have to stay tuned, listen to the whole episode, because there's definitely no such thing as a skip function on podcast players. So why don't you kick us off with your first story? Okay, so my first story is about how while puberty will still suck, there might finally be a reason for it. I don't know about you, but I would say being a teenager was probably one of the hardest things I ever did. Like genuinely like the most, the most challenging time because you go through an enormous amount of changes and you also have all of the bits of education that really matter thrown at you at that point. It's, it's not a great combination of things to happen to anybody, but everyone goes through it. And for a long time, we weren't, we thought, you know, it's to do with maturing from a, a child into an adult. But this story that I found is about a Megan Gunner, who is a researcher looking into brain chemistry of children who faced adversity when they were very young. So we're talking about stuff like being orphaned, not getting shots at a doctor. That's not adversity, that's life. But focusing on children who'd been orphaned, and what she found was that changes in the brain's chemistry in adolescence can actually rebalance the stress hormones and the way that we deal with them because early childhood trauma has been shown repeatedly to give children a greater likelihood of developing things like diabetes, poor memory function, difficulty with dealing with stress, that kind of thing. And this is all linked to a thing called the HPA um, axis, which is a bunch of systems in the brain and also the kidneys i think brain is linked to the craziest things isn't it <laughs> yeah it's it's almost like it runs stuff right <laughs> <laughs> hpa is uh hyper it refers to hypothalamus as the h pituitary gland which regulates an enormous bunch of things which there's a really good chapter on in bill bryson's the body which i read recently i highly recommend that book and no sponsorship deal unfortunately <laughs> and the A stands for adrenal, which is a bit which I think is in the kidneys, but I might be misremembering that. And these work together essentially to process stress um, and our reactions to them. And if you undergo trauma as a child, then these sort of get out of whack. And that's the thing that's linked to issues with stress. But during adolescence, they seem to rebalance, providing you're not undergoing trauma then too. But yeah, I thought it was a really a really neat little article about something which I don't think about a whole lot and which I don't I don't think that we do talk about very much in society is the idea of positive de-stressing changes as a teenager. I think we associate 
being a teenager with with stress most of the time yeah definitely in combination of exams and social pressures and especially now more than ever where you have a thousand friends on probably not on facebook on on whatever platform of choice tockety tick i think it is at the moment we're old we're so old <laughs> it's like you're saying i mean I, I i definitely miss the lions i got as a teenager and uh, and having more time to play video games but mm. it was definitely a very tough time um as you say in a lot of ways and i mean that that makes sense but that's really interesting about the research kind of having the rebalancing i mean presumably it, it doesn't always work 100 percent, or because you, you mentioned some yeah. of the factors that childhood trauma causes leading into later life like diabetes and things so presumably this puberty it gives a chance to rebalance or, or do you have any more detail on that you've got that exactly right then it's it's almost like everybody gets a second chance even if they had a really rough childhood your teenage years are are a chance for your body to rebalance and return to levels that will allow you to become a a regular functioning adult it seems like we should be giving more teenagers the chance to make use of that rebalancing impact and not be throwing i mean we've had a big scandal i know uh, over in the uk they had that big scandal about a level results where they just used an algorithm and people who were predicted b's and then got given f's or u's because the algorithm said someone had to and mm. they just kind of got unlucky and yeah i heard about this i mean all of that on top of everything else is i've long thought that the school system should be more geared towards helping people find out what they're good at and how they can maybe pursue that rather than just examining them to death to try and and mm. then there's so much pressure to be good at mathematics and sciences and yeah i totally agree with you and i think the best we can do is pass on that message that there is that it does it does get better i said before you know i think i think being a teenager is one of the toughest things you go through in life and the upside of that is that it does end and i would say it gets better from there so far yeah and it never feels like it but i i'm slowly even now i'm still not quite come to the full realization i don't think mm. but that I, I still have hopefully the the majority of my life ahead of me and yeah. that i have a lot of especially now as we improve in terms of our health and uh, technology and, and and everything that there's a lot more opportunities coming coming up um hopefully you do realize that teenager yeah the teenage years are a, a small part in um a long life for uh, uh, the vast majority of people you, you do realize that eventually they just feel never-ending when they when you're going through them because they are <laughs> it is incredible how much quicker time goes when you hit your 20s and 30s it's it's unbelievable uh, i remember a summer used to last about four years and a weekend was about a month and a school day took about 16 years and now I, I i wake up on monday and blink and suddenly it's thursday afternoon yeah you know who else feels a lot of stress jack oh first segue of the season <laughs> yeah <laughs> I feel like we need to have claxons or something like it's like doo, 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 doo. <laughs> the answer is elephants elephants get stressed elephants get stressed i love your stories ben <laughs> I, I love this story. So yeah, apparently some of the uh, the elephants at Warsaw Zoo in Poland have been feeling a bit stressed, and the veterinarian um, over at the zoo has come up with a, a rather unusual, although probably less and less unusual now, way of treating that stress, mm. and that's by using marijuana. Cool. So it works on elephants too. <laughs> yes, yeah, but specifically not the bit that gets you high, but the cannabinoid um, CBD, which mm. is is becoming very popular around the world now, is the, the elements you can get from certain strains of marijuana that basically relax you and the relaxing aspects, but not the bits that that make you high and unable to drive and and, and all the bad stuff. I didn't know they were different. I genuinely didn't know they were different bits. I can't remember the exact name of it now, but the bit that gets you high is TCH, I think, in cannabis. Oh, I think it might be THC. THC, that's it. But yeah, yeah, um, that rings a bell. And then CBD is another oil, but you can actually separate them out. And Interesting. Apparently around, it's become very popular now to breed strains of marijuana that have very little to no THC, but a lot of CBD. And then they mm. turn it into oils and into ingestibles and things like that. And it helps people relax and it's perfectly legal because you don't have the elements of it being... Well, it's, it's legal in a lot of places, I should say. I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to say it's definitely legal everywhere. It's, it's definitely <laughs> legal in a lot of places um, in Europe and, and in the US as well. But uh, yeah, and apparently they've already tried this on dogs and horses with pretty good effects, uh, as well as humans, obviously. 
And yeah, they, they just give the elephants a few uh, drops of the... Actually, you don't even need that many drops. You, you'd think they kind of have to have the barrel a day, but um, no, they probably have mm. about a dozen drops of oil two or three times a day. It's going to be two years before they actually see the results, but they're, they're giving it a try. And hopefully this will help them also better able to study the elephants and also help with conservation efforts as well. Because obviously if you, can, if you can make sure elephants are more stress-free in um, unnatural environments, then you can, they, they'll help with breeding programs and, mm. um, and just their own well-being and comfort in the situation that they're in which is which is great this is a bit of a segue do 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 <laughs> but i can't really do a klaxon noise but <laughs> sorry it's a bit it's a bit of a tangent but has this been tried on fish because i i have many memories of someone i used to work with getting really upset that their fish were dying and their fish were dying of stress this article doesn't mention fish and i'm not sure how easy it is to feed drops of oil to a fish yeah that was that was what i was thinking i imagine it wouldn't mix well with the water <laughs> i mean presumably you could drop it in as in feed or something like that yeah fish food capsules mm. maybe that have contain it and then who knows interesting that's really cool that's a really interesting take on conservation as well like i like the the hybrid of well-known drug and uh elephant that's a nice that's a nice combo i should also say i'll try and remember to post this picture but the, the picture they have is of the elephant um in a mud bath and it just looks so relaxed but it's also holding <laughs> its trunk up to its mouth just to hide the joint <laughs> yes <laughs> but it just looks really happy and relaxed and it's quite it's a very nice picture to see actually so nice so yeah that was god first story of season two and we got a segue and everything i mean this is this is a good start a good start it feels great, doesn't it, to be back doing this? It does, yeah. Like, I'm really happy. <laughs> yeah, same. I missed this while we've been away. My, my segue, which I always announce as a segue, because if I didn't, how would we know, is elephants go boom, right? In a non-explosive way. Elephants go boom when they walk, in popular imagination, or, or possibly just my imagination. And so does the earth occasionally. So my next story is about carbon dioxide possibly being the cause of a bunch of Italian earthquakes. That thing just, it, it keeps cropping up with new issues, doesn't it? That carbon dioxide. It's just <laughs> all around. It's, it's, it's not someone you want to invite back to the party is all I'm saying. Yeah, you've got your global warming, you've got your earthquakes. But I mean, at least you've got fizzy drinks, right? Oh, I was going to say that was a downside again, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good point. This, this particular piece of research lined up the spikes in the release of CO2, you know, because you can track that through environmental data. It also lined up the big earthquakes of recent-ish history. And what they found was there is a really strong correspondence between the two. So while this doesn't mean that it's definitely, definitely, definitely causal, it does suggest that there's some connection going on there. There's certainly a correlative instance there it could be that the earthquake actually causes the release but conversely what they're looking at at the moment is possibly the buildup of co2 in the mantle which is the bit below the crust in the makeup of the earth oh, i thought you were talking about pizza yeah we we could do a pizza analogy we're not going to do a pizza analogy yeah so the bit below the crust which is the top layer that we live on below that is the mantle and in the center there is the core which is split into inner and outer but Buildup of CO2 in the mantle, which is by far the biggest bit, is possibly the reason for that fracturing. Of course, what they describe it as a sort of chicken and egg problem, in that they're not sure which came first, the release of the buildup of the CO2 or the weakness in that region, or perhaps the release in that region and then the CO2. It's, it's very difficult to sense, but it's quite an interesting take on the earthquake. And it would also, if we could learn to detect those buildups, it will give us a really good method of detecting big earthquakes before they happen, which is a long-running problem in geology, in that we, you just cannot predict this stuff at all with any reasonable um, certainty. To me, and I quite like this theory, so I suppose I, I see it everywhere, but it really seems to me to suggest more evidence of Gaia theory, of just how connected mm. the Earth is, and how every... It is almost, you know, every little thing of, of the Earth makes so... It is so connected and has so much impact on each other that we just don't realize in that you yeah know, co2 putting co2 into the atmosphere in you know argentina suddenly causes an earthquake in well it doesn't suddenly cause an earthquake in uh, italy, <laughs> but you know it, it can have an impact on earth, earthquakes in italy and 
That's yeah. that's actually incredible. Uh, it'd be really interesting to see what more they find out about that. Yeah, is that the that's the James Lovelock one, isn't it? The Gaia theory. I actually can't. I'm not quite sure where it's come from, but 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 what I mean by it is essentially yes, the Earth is just much more interconnected and. Mm we have much more of an impact on the earth than we think and how we are um, everything is much more connected than we think yeah no, I, I completely agree with you i partic- i like the analogy as well of argentinian stuff affecting stuff on the outside world because that is it is important to look at the global picture we don't do that enough we're all on the same planet and that, that's kind of what counts yeah one of the best books i'd actually recommend <laughs> this is actually a trilogy the broken earth trilogy by nk jemison Oh, yeah absolutely fantastic i think i might recommend at least you before it's definitely a big theme running throughout the book of the interconnectedness of earth and it's just really interesting the way she explores it mm. really really interesting yeah for, from earthquakes to superbugs I, I i'm not convinced that that was up to your usual segue standards both disasters i mean especially now i think we can all appreciate the the disasters caused by superbugs but this is actually mm. uh, a way of fighting superbugs cool uh, which is great so we're keeping this positive keeping this positive keep that vibe <laughs> keep that vibe indeed so uh, as i don't know how many people out there probably give, given you're listening to this podcast probably a lot of you are, are familiar with bacterial resistance and um, superbugs are essentially bacteria diseases that are uh, resistant to drugs and there is becoming a bigger and bigger problem mm. particularly as we use up existing antibiotics to make sure cattle don't get colds and and things like that um, it's becoming a big issue so scientists have long been looking for a way a non-chemical way of defeating these superbugs and what they've discovered is that cicada wings and dragonfly wings actually have a natural way of doing it using i'm gonna get this right using nano patterns nano just makes anything sound cool doesn't it is that like a sort of a pattern that means that the the bacteria just can't grow on it or something like that no so um essentially uh, wings of cicadas and dragonflies are covered in um, tiny nano pillars so basically very 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 small pillars are invisible to the human eye mm-hmm. but what they do is that uh, when bacteria land on these nanostructures when the the wing moves it actually it's so small that it kind of it can rip apart the bacteria damage the the cell membrane and eventually kills the bacteria so it's that is genius it's small enough that it's kind of almost like barbed wire i guess to mm. the bacteria and then the barbed wire moves and it, it can rip apart and um, the bacteria which uh, i i understand from this article it is very positive because bacteria you, you can't be resistant to physically being pulled mm. apart it's not like a, a, a drug or an antibiotic it, it's it's dismemberment isn't it it's that <laughs> essentially but uh, yeah scientists are engineering these kind of nano shapes uh, i'm just putting mm. this article actually puts nano in front of everything that's not me that's the article i, I believe you and uh, <laughs> yeah th- this could be this could be a really interesting way for example you could use it if you could find out a way to apply it to the masks that are so in vogue right mm. now then it'd be a really it'd be a more effective way of being able to kill bacteria especially in risky environments like in hospitals and things and it could also it's it involve hopefully a lot less pollution and things of cleaners and and stuff like that and antibacterial wipes and things so really interesting story scientists from rmit university the lead author was professor elena ivanova it, what's what is rmit is that it's the royal melbourne institute of technology that's cool australian scientists doing good weaving nano patterns just so you can kill literally everything that touches you i like how as you said weaving you went into a sort of old lady crocheting voice just for a moment <laughs> so the, the reason they can start making these nano structured surfaces is through the advancement in nano fabrication technologies i just wanted to get some more nano in there yeah i suppose it's going to be a case of making sort of scourers and stuff like like ways of cleaning stuff and surfaces with these nano patterns which will be the, which will be where the application is because you i suppose you can't really you can't give a patient a, a nano pattern pill because it will rip bits of them apart yeah I, I think it is and also presumably for masks yeah. personal protective equipment and that kind of thing as well i i mean I'm, i imagine that there's probably a, an issue with there there is some bacteria that we don't want to destroy potentially but yeah so i don't don't know how uh, how they're going to apply this they're still a little way off from being used in medical or industrial applications it's looking a bit more promising now as i said with the 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 nano advancements and nanofabrication technologies have shown nano promise for opening a nano new era of biomedical antimicrobial nanotechnology she nano said nano lee nano nano lee (laughs) (laughs) nano crochet (laughs) nana's nano crochet Coming to you live from Melbourne. I love that idea.
Can we do a magazine? Can we do a magazine where people like write in and send us their mini crochet patterns? We're into tangent territory now, aren't we? <laughs> Potentially. I'm just going to say the headline of this is Mechanobactericidal Actions of Nanostructured Surfaces. What a great name. I know. <laughs> And it's only got nano in it once. It's still an amazing name though. It's still an amazing name. But anyway, yeah, I think we spent a lot of time saying mm. nano. So do, do you have a story for us back in the big universe? Sort of potentially kind of smaller. This is a subatomic story. We're going deep below the nano. It's the measurement of energy levels in positronium. I chose it because it said positive. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, the measurement of the positronium's energy levels are not making sense basically for scientists so the energy levels are predicted by quantum mechanics to be one thing and the results are another and it's a difference of about 0.02 uh, percent which might not sound like a lot but experimental error is 0.003 percent so it's like more than four times the acceptable error from an experiment so it's like it's a big gap especially when you talk about on a subatomic scale oh yeah like lit literally every number is a big number then <laughs> what are we talking about positronium Positro <laughs> yeah tromium yeah positronium i had also not heard of it before it's made of uh, an electron with a negative charge circling in orbit with a positron so it's like it's a bit like those uh, binary star systems the, the issue they're having, basically, is the quantum mechanics that is making the prediction seems to be sound. It's a quantum electrodynamical proof, for all that, that means anything to either of us. But the problem is that the experiment also seems to be fairly sound. So what they've done is they've published it and they've gone, please find the correct experimental results somewhere else because at the moment we just don't know and um, there's a quote from physicist david cassidy who co-authored the study saying it's going to be something surprising i just don't know what with regards to uh the solution to this this seems to happen a lot in when you talk about quantum physics and things yeah. on the quantum level it's just it doesn't work when you go slightly outside of the quantum like it's always two things that they just don't add up and mm. no one can quite figure out why like 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 gravity and things we just can't marry the everything together into a nice cohesive theory or or understanding yeah i mean the big problem is that either quantum physics or relativity is flawed in some way or possibly both and we we don't have a theory which marries those two but it's it'll come It'll come in time, hopefully. Is it pessimistic of me to think that in a couple of hundred years time, there'll be a teacher explaining how, and now kids, we're going to learn about quantum physics, but first a little bit of history. So we went on the wrong track for, for 300 years because Einstein forgot to carry the one. It could totally be something like that. I just have this feeling that that's going to be that. And we may yeah. not see the, the actual figuring out in our lifetime, but it'll be, we go back and think, they used to think, yeah, it was it was God's fighting that caused thunder. Did you ever hear of, uh, of Phlogiston? Phlogiston. It sounds like a town in Jonathan Swift book. It really could be. And it, it existed as a theory around the time of Jonathan Swift, actually. So Phlogiston was this, this sort of imaginary substance. So when a bucket rusted, it gained Phlogiston. And when water evaporated, it lost Phlogiston. And Phlogiston was this sort of like meta material that was the sort of basis of chemical reaction, supposedly. But the best minds in science believed in the Phlogiston theory of reactions so we could totally be in a situation like that. It's just very hard to see when you're in it. Eventually something will come along, like the isolation of, of oxygen by Cavendish, which will show us, oh, so there are these little things called atoms, and there are these chemical elements. Ooh. And then we can have a fun time discussing how the chemical elements fit together on a table. It's just that at the moment, our best guess is relativity and the standard model of quantum mechanics and... It could just be phlogiston. That it. <laughs> I hope we see the day when we have that kind of breakthrough. That would be that would be pretty incredible. That would thing to witness. Yeah. Well, you know what? Mm. Whenever those scientists are carrying out their experiments, they're definitely going to need batteries. That was a good segue. 
Yeah, I'm rating that as a 7 out of 10. <laughs> but yeah, so scientists in uh, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore, mm. have been trying to figure out a better way of recycling batteries. I'm sure many of you have probably seen the little bucket at the supermarket or, or however it is you recycle your batteries, but um, batteries eventually die and they actually contain a lot of useful um, materials that you can get back out of the batteries when you recycle them. However, the, the most common method... Uh, at the moment is to basically melt them down which requires heat of over 500 degrees centigrade uh, to smelt it and then you extract the metals from that which is quite energy intensive and also releases a lot of harmful gases which is not ideal so uh, other people have been exploring this idea of hydrometallurgy which is another word that i really like you basically put the batteries into water after you crush them and then you use acids to get the the metals separated out and then and, and then extract them but that also creates a lot of secondary pollutants mm. But what they found is that instead of the, the conventional industrial acids that they were using, is they can use oranges. <laughs> this is what I mean when I say we could be in a phlogiston moment. It's like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. oh yeah, well, we made this amazing oven that heats stuff to 5,000 degrees, and then we tried pouring intense industrial acid on it. What about oranges? <laughs> what about oranges? <laughs> have, you tr have we tried lemons? There's, there are so many fruits to pick from. I mean, lemon, lemon, lemons come into it as well. Lemons come into it as well, <laughs> but potentially. They basically found that dried and ground orange peel into a powder and then also used mm. uh, citric acid, which you get from lemons and from other citrus fruits. Mm -hmm. um, then you basically do the same thing as the, the hydrometallurgy that they were doing before and you're able to extract the metal. So they were able to extract about 90% of the cobalt, lithium, nickel and manganese from spent lithium ion batteries, um, which is pretty similar to how they were doing it before with the acids. I should have mentioned the acids included hydrogen peroxide. So yeah, apparently the, the cellulose found in orange peel is is converted to, into sugars during the extraction process and they do still need to heat this up a bit um, that they do mention here yeah. um, and as i said they have to dry the the orange peel which does take a bit of um, heat but not 500 degrees but yeah. yeah just just carrying on with the theme of words is i love that this bit just sounds like it's a health commercial instead but it's like naturally occurring antioxidants found in orange peel such as flavonoids and phenolic <laughs> acids could also contribute to the enhancement of this nature is so cool it genuinely amazes me, like, when we, that we're still finding new uses for stuff that we've had for uh, since the dawn of history. <laughs> I know. How many orange peels have not been used to recycle batteries when they could have been? Appalling. I know. Not only is this a much more environmentally friendly process that doesn't produce a lot of pollutants, but obviously, uh, you know, re mm. recycling, making battery recycling cheaper is a good thing because as we move towards electrification yeah. of transport, we're going to need a lot more batteries and lithium and cobalt, things like that, are, are difficult to mine and often in very, I, I think the Democratic Republic of the Congo has uh, a lot of the world's cobalt reserves i want to say and it's a very dangerous and difficult I place you're right. to get mines and also there's been a lot of um, human rights abuses there and things so so having a better way of getting it is is fantastic that's a really cool story i think it's probably the most optimistic story we've had in this episode yeah. so thank you for picking that as was that your last that, story? that was yeah that was the the last one i think uh, three each is a good place to end i really liked that story but uh, I, I always so many of these stories raise the question for me of how did they figure that out i mean i, I can kind of see that you know <laughs> they had hydrogen peroxide outside it's like where can we get mm. a cheaper acid from i don't know let's try lemon juice acid let's try citric acid because someone was drinking lemonade and thought hang on a minute but also just the fact that they kind of went you know was it more convoluted than that did someone just kind of drop their orange juice on a battery and be like hang on a second mm. <laughs> i mean i would guess it was probably a clever chemist looked at the existing process and was like oh i know where we can get some stuff to bond with sugars yeah i would guess i think that's great like i love that this stuff still happens like there's still stuff to discover yeah that's one of the wonderful things about living in at this yeah, time and it always again it just begs the question for me if it is either someone dropped it in their orange juice and you kind of had that eureka moment or it is someone mm. actually took the time to look at it and go like actually orange would work here really well and then like the ceo of the company turns around and hits the, the older guy on the head and say why on earth didn't you think of that we've been used buying hydrogen peroxide for <laughs> an absolute fortune <laughs> so mystery, mystery segment? segment i've lost the mystery segment here here you go so that <laughs> almost concludes our show thank you very much for listening but as we have uh, hinted at at the start of this episode we now have a new mystery segment which will give you our, our wonderful appreciated audience a chance to learn a little bit more about myself and jack uh, so jack is going to i think you should roll the dice jack roll the dice yeah. roll it in uh, within audio of the mic yeah hope 
Oh, that was that was a satisfying sound. So nice. So we've got. It's a who is. Jack has rolled the dice and it has told him to draw a card from one of three possible piles. And on that card is going to be a question that Jack is going to ask of me. So this was a who is. So he is going to ask me, you know, who... Uh, well, actually, let's find out. It's just... Yeah, probably the best way is just for you to ask me the question. <laughs> yeah. I should also like to add that the uh, the game is called The Empathy Game and is available uh, wherever you get Hashtag your games. not a sponsor. Yet. Yes, hashtag not a sponsor. That is our hashtag, hashtag not a sponsor. Your question is, how would your friends describe you? Pedantic. That, that's got to be the number one word, pedantic. Um, I'd, say, I'd say probably organised as well would be a, a word that would come to mind. Um, I, I want to say weird would maybe be up there as a, as a, a word that would be first on people's minds. Um, grumpy potentially <laughs> but in like a slightly funny way you know we don't want to spend too much time with him but when we do you know we we get a few laughs kind of away uh, I, I don't know um those are probably the words that come to my mind immediately do, do you think any different i consider you a friend the first one that comes to mind is caring okay i would say caring maybe talkative um easy easy to talk to um like literally from from the very first day I met you, you were one of the easiest people I've ever met. I'm really to talk glad to. you said easy to talk to and then just leave it easy because mm. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I opted for talking to it first because I I was just like I wonder I wonder if that easy will be taken out of context. <laughs> but yeah, I no, you're you're wonderfully easy to talk to and you can tell that you care. Um, whenever I I talk to you or I see you talking with the people, you can see that you're fully there in the moment of the conversation and that's something i really like about oh you. thank you oh you're so sweet thank you jack <laughs> that's really nice i guess uh well i, I should pr probably point out here that jack's the only one with the deck of cards so i guess uh, should we just reverse the question back to you or do you want to pick a different question for yourself yeah i yeah i think let's stick with the same one um because that's quite a nice way to do this and that will also mean we can keep the segment going longer because i have a finite <laughs> amount of cards yes um yeah so how how would my friends describe me um i'd like to say curious um because that's that's very much how uh i see myself but i i suspect it probably comes across as obsessive occasionally <laughs> um fairly I, I probably like internationally orientated comes uh, comes across um like i have a huge interest in other cultures um and in in learning about them and connecting with them um i think the the only negative one that comes to mind is uh absent because i am often like someone who's not there all the time um i sort of drop out of contact for long periods um either when i'm traveling or just when i i happen to be in a different country from from one of the people i'm close to i i actually uh, the first word i'd have said is intelligent because that definitely comes across well but i think actually curiosity is a better way of saying that because yeah jack is definitely and it, it often it often leads into fantastic situations because jack is he's always very happy to to ask the question or just to try something <laughs> i'll never forget the time when we were <laughs> we were in america and there we found a, a machine that gave about 20 different no it must have been more than must have been like 50 different flavors of uh, soft drink and jack just tried them all no hesitation just every <laughs> single one <laughs> went into the cup just to try it so yeah curious is definitely a very uh, very good word but i'd say um and then yeah like uh, kind of the intelligent i suppose that also fits in very much with the, your international um focus as well because yeah jack is always um yeah definitely interested in learning about other other cultures but just interested in learning about anything and everything um in general except with the exception of maybe reality television and even that fascinates you from from a certain perspective i'd say that's true <laughs> it's like a it's an anthropological perspective <laughs> it's like oh that is what they exactly. do exactly yeah <laughs> so... and I, I don't I, I can't i'm trying to think of a way to sum that up into a single word but i don't think there is but yeah just very um jack jack really really cares about his friends like if, if he's if you are his friend and even if he doesn't contact you for a while you know like he, he really really cares and he will want when you do speak to him again he will want to find out everything that's happened in in you and uh in your life and um and probably not in you that's <laughs> not a good way of saying that <laughs> yeah he'll just want to find out everything that's happening i want to find out exactly how you are and uh you know you always 
get to the you you won't have a very superficial conversation uh, with you i don't think like it'll always mean something uh, every conversation i'd say we, we've had is we don't we don't just kind of have the you know how are you how's the weather in undisclosed location <laughs> that's true that's very true i that's a that's a really nice way of saying that i always think of that as being bad at small talk but that's a really thank you <laughs> that's yeah, a really nice it's definitely a positive it. <laughs> i guess that's that's the conclusion of this round of of mystery round although we can't call it mystery round anymore because it's not a mystery no. is it we know what it is so what should we call let's just call it the empathy round yeah or get to know the host maybe something like that yeah um yeah host host disclosure host i don't know knowledge host knowledge knowledge <laughs> time i like that okay host host knowledge knowledge okay it's the knowledge round <laughs> let us know what you thought if you if you like the segment um if you didn't like it uh we'll probably keep doing it anyway <laughs> we're gonna keep doing it <laughs> i mean uh, we hope you all enjoyed the first episode of season two we do have an entire season uh, uh from yeah. season one obviously if you want to go back and listen to us um it's all evergreen it's all evergreen uh exactly but uh please subscribe to the show to never miss an episode and rate and review us um, wherever you have the power to do so um yeah if you want to get in touch about the show then leave a comment uh, on youtube get in touch with us on twitter or instagram where we are at not a buffalo pod uh we are not a buffalo podcast on facebook and we have a website not a buffalo.wordpress.com and we are always open to comments uh suggestions and just fr friendly chats as well but thank you very much for listening bye it's true Bye.